Welcome to the Pictomancer 1 to 100 leveling skills guide. I'll be going over all of your skills as you train to draw your enemies as the Soy Jack and yourself as the Chad, better than the rest of them, but also hopefully kill your enemies along the way. Watch as you go from this? Like, if you think AI art is a good thing, you're literally too stupid to use this guide. To this. This is a beginner-focused series, aimed to help even those new to Final Fantasy XIV, the MMO genre, or still just need a little help. In that same vein, this will be focused on your actions and how to use them. We'll not be going deep into optimization, instead focused on the general play and giving general opening rotations. We will go through these together in order to help new players understand the process. If you wish to push your play further, there are further places you can research the job. The goal here is to drop players in on the ground level so they can make strides to improve themselves. Tooltips are broken up by expansion and that expansion's level cap. So level 80 for Shadowbringers and what the job starts at, 90 for Endwalker, and our final level cap of 100 in Dawn Trail. I recommend all players add Sprint and Limit Break to their hotbars, both found in the General tab of the Actions menu. And as for how my hotbars build, it'll make sense at 100. Just put your skills on your hotbars so that you are comfortable as you play. Everyone has their own way of doing things. If you want more info on the how and why I set up my UI, check the description for a video about it. Finally, keep in mind that this is an active MMO. Patches can and will change jobs. Check the description for a quick overview of each patch's changes or special notes. With all that out of the way, please support me in whatever way you can. Check my links below, and let's begin. Pictomancer is a job unlike any other. It has few buttons and not much done by each, but a completely new type of playstyle. Your main mechanic is painting, obviously. What makes this so special is how you are intentionally doing no damage while you paint. Yet the power of these skills is so high, it more than offsets the time spent on it. So much so that as of writing this, we're likely going to see some nerfs. Pictomancer embodies the idea of upkeep more than any other job due to this investment. With starting at such a high level, you're already picking up what is essentially a complete job. While you do get a few new skills on your way to level 100, you're starting with most of your skills. So while the job can be easy to grasp for some, others can find this late start a hurdle. To obtain the Pictomancer job, complete your level 10 class quest and be level 80. There are no further requirements beyond owning the Dawn Trail expansion. Once you do, head outside of the Contras Guild in Gridania. You'll find the Pictomancer NPC waiting for your help here. Before continuing into your job skills, remember that every job comes with a set of role actions. These have their own uses and deserve space on your hotbars. Linked in the description is a separate role action guide. Be sure you're not ignoring this part of your toolkit. Pictomancer may be very different to anything else in the game, but we do have a couple of starting skills that are simple to go into as a start. Levels 1, 5, and 15, Fire in Red, Arrow in Green, and Water in Blue. With a large 25 yom range and costing 300 MP each, this is your basic combo. They do 340, 380, and 420 potency of damage to a chosen target respectively. Their cast times are 1.5 seconds, with a global cooldown recast of 2.5 seconds. This gives you plenty of movement time between attacks. The cast time is very important to keep in mind going forward. How the combo works and the effects that come as a result of finishing a combo will come in a bit. We need the full picture first. Levels 25, 35, and 45, Fire 2 in red, Arrow 2 in green, and Water 2 in blue. These have the same range, cost, and cast times as the other spells. The difference in these is that these are area of effects, AoEs. They hit the target and all enemies within a 5 yom range of that target. They do 100, 120, and 140 potency to all enemies hit. With these numbers, it is actually only better to do AoE on 4 or more enemies. If there are 3 enemies alive, it is still better to use single target spells. Level 60, Palette Gauge and Subtractive Palette. Completion of either of these combos will grant you 25 points into the Palette Gauge. It caps out at 100 Gauge. You can spend 50 Gauge for one use of Subtractive Palette. This grants you three stacks of the Subtractive Palette buff, granting you three uses of a different set of skills. Each skill in the next two sets will cost one stack. Level 60, Blizzard and Cyan, 
Stone in Yellow, and Thunder in Magenta. All your skills have the same 25 Yom range, but all other effects of this combo differ. They each have a 2.3 second cast time, with a 3.3 second recast time. They also cost 400 MP, slower and a slightly higher cost, but that's more than made up for with their power. They do 630, 670, and 710 potency of damage. We want to use these skills over our base combo for sure. The power is just that high, no matter how slow these are. The only problem is if you make the mistake of using Subtractive Palette before movement. This makes casting and moving around much harder. On the other hand, Swift Cast is stronger in this context. 3.3 seconds of movement before your next cast. Level 60, Blizzard 2 in Cyan, Stone 2 in Yellow, and Thunder 2 in Magenta. Much like the level 2 spells of your base combo, these are the AoE versions of skills in Subtractive Palette. They have the same 5 Yom range, doing 220, 240, and 260 potency to all enemies hit, respectively. Looking at these numbers, these are actually better on as few as 3 enemies. However, this will not remain true as you level up. If you really want to min-max, then sure, pay attention to the potencies, but I would recommend pretending these are also only stronger on 4 or more enemies, even before that is true. Before going on, I'd like to talk about Aether Hues. Using your combos, Aether Hue is going to progress. Using the first hit in any combo grants Aether Hues. The second hit of the combo needs Aether Hues to be used, and will grant Aether Hues too. The third hit of the combo requires Aether Hues too. This is true of all four of these combos, meaning all four combos will progress at the same time. If you use Fire or Fire 2 in red, and then use Subtractive Palette, the Subtractive Palette skills will already be on Stone and Stone 2 in yellow. This makes Pictomance's normal attacks very freeform. No effort in swapping between single target and AoE. No effort in swapping back and forth between base and Subtractive Palette. You can even put the skills next to each other for them to be nearly the same button inputs. Level 80, Enhanced Artistry, and Holy in White. Finishing a full combo, Water in Blue or Thunder in Magenta, will grant you one splotch of white paint on the palette gauge. These allow you to use Holy in White, an instant cast spell costing 300 MP. It hits the specified enemy with a 5 Yom AoE centered on it, dealing 420 potency to it, and 168 potency to all other enemies hit. This sounds pretty good, especially when it gets buffed later, but it's mainly a movement tool. You can store up to 5 uses of white paint, so that no matter how heavily a fight expects you to be moving around, you'll have up to over 12 seconds of uninterrupted movement if you pull your paint properly. The weird thing about this though, is that it is only worth it for movement. Unless you're finishing an enemy off with this instead of your base combo, there's nearly no gain to use white paint in the majority of cases. So much so, that you don't have to worry about overcapping this resource. You can just sit on 5 stacks at all times, and spend only when you need to run around. The simple reason for this is Subtractive Palette. You will gain so much damage from extra Subtractive Palette uses, it offsets any perceived lost damage. Level 30, Creature Motifs, Living Muses, and Mog of the Ages. There are a lot of individual tooltips involved in this one, so we're going to have to break it down quite a bit. Let's start with just Creature Motif and the motifs it can become. Starting off, this attack has two different cast times. Outside of combat, it has an instant cast time and a global cooldown of 1.5 seconds. During combat, this has a high 3 second cast and 4 second global cooldown. This cast time is worth it. Now you're not going to see Creature Motif on your hotbar. To start, it will be Palm Motif and become the blank Creature Motif after casting. Your character will paint the motif in the air and onto the Creature Canvas UI element. The button will become unusable while you have a motif on the canvas. That is because of the second part, the Living Muse button. This is a skill with charges. You can store multiple uses of charge skills, with Living Muse having a maximum of two. It has a 40 second cooldown per charge of it. The skill will change based on the motif painted onto the creature canvas, so rendering the Palm motif will turn Living Muse into Palm Muse. 
Using Palm Muse will spend one of the charges for an instant cast ability. This can be weaved between other spell casts. While rendering a motif is a GCD, using the Muse is an OGCD. This does an AoE on your current target, hitting it and all enemies within 5 yams. It does a massive 1000 potency of damage to the original target, and 400 potency to the rest. Using the Muse will add it to this little bit on top of the creature canvas. Even with the cast time, even with the 4 second recast, this is by far worth it. Plus you can store 2 charges, so right after dropping one Muse, you can get right to using another Muse right away. Going back to the Creature Motif button, it has become Winged Motif. Painting it will add wings to the canvas and allow you to use Winged Muse. Functionally, Winged Motif and Muse are the exact same as Palm Motif and Muse, down to the size and damage. The reason it is different is for a measure of progress. After every second living Muse, after every winged Muse, a little Moogle will pop up on top of the creature canvas while the palm icon is removed. This allows you to use Mog of the Ages. This is a separate attack and button with its own effects. Like the Muses, it is an instant cast OGCD. The rest of the effects are all unique. It has a 30 second cooldown and you are able to hold onto this Moogle for as long as you wish. So long as you don't get a second winged Muse out, you won't even lose your next Mog. You're not going to want to hold on to it though, because this is an 1100 potency attack doing a line AoE at your target. It goes a full 25 yams forward, dealing 440 potency of damage to all enemies after the first. So in a vacuum, ignoring the rest of your toolkit, you can do the following. Palm Motif, Palm Muse, Winged Motif, Winged Muse, Mog of the Ages. In total, over 3000 potency even on just one target. We're not going to do things like that, we're going to properly time our motif paintings and properly weave the abilities between GCDs. The point is to show the flow of the skills and impart how extremely powerful they are. Let me re-emphasize, if you use Winged Muse again without having used Mog of the Ages, you will lose that use of Mog of the Ages. You cannot store multiple uses. Level 50, Weapon Motif, Steel Muse, and Hammer Stamp. This works very similar to the Creature Motif, but with its own set of buttons. Weapon Motif is the base version of the button, but when placed on the hotbar, it will turn into Hammer Motif. Using Hammer Motif will paint the motif on the weapon canvas. There is only one motif this time though. Steel Muse, meanwhile, is what holds the motif when on the canvas. It will turn into Striking Muse when the motif is painted and has a 60 second cooldown to use the Striking Muse. You cannot use this outside of combat. Using the Striking Muse will give 3 stacks of Hammer Time, or 3 uses of the Hammer Stamp button. Hammer Stamp is a 5 yam AoE on a target for 480 potency on the chosen enemy, 192 potency for every enemy in the Splash Zone. This is an instant cast, meaning you can run and jump around all you want for all 3 uses. It's not that simple though, because of the part where it says, damage as a critical direct hit. The critical hit stat can cause attacks and heals to be a critical hit or heal, dealing bonus damage or healing. Direct hits from the direct hit stat are more common but weaker versions of critical hit. They also cannot work on heals. These can both happen at the same time. At minimum, a critical direct hit is an increase of 75% damage. It gets higher with more stat points, but we'll work with that minimum. So while all the rest of your skills have the potential to do bonus damage of 75%, Hammer Stamp is guaranteed this bonus. So it has no chance to be stronger, it's consistently powerful. Factoring in that guaranteed direct crit, that's a consistent 840 potency hit to the initial target and 336 potency to all enemies around it. Given you get 3 hits of this for every use of Striking Muse, this is a huge amount of damage. Makes sense given the cast times for the motifs, but it bears repeating. Level 70, Landscape Motif, Scenic Muse, and Starry Muse. The mechanics are the same as with the other two motifs. We paint the Landscape Motif to activate the Scenic Muse button. Here we paint the Starry Sky Motif. While using it has a 120 second, 2 minute cooldown. 
With such a long cooldown, this one has to be especially powerful, right? Well, to start not that strong, the main power of this is all going to come with your levels. Right now though, this grants all allies within a 30 yarm radius, extremely long range, a 5% damage buff for 20 seconds. This includes you. Further, you are given Subtractive Spectrum for 30 seconds. This is one free use of Subtractive Palette, even if your gauge is completely empty. So immediately after using this to buff all damage by 5%, you can go into Subtractive Palette to access your strongest spells. Because this is a 2 minute cooldown, you have a lot of time to find a place to paint it. You also have a lot of time to forget to paint it. So let's have a bit of an overall chat about your paintings. We want to be proactive with painting. So much so, it's actually worth it to paint a creature motif in openers. Now, this is because doing so will give us both the creature motif attack and Mog of the Ages. But it really goes to show just how powerful your paintings are if standing still and casting for 3 seconds is worth it over, well, any other option. This time spent only applies because of that specific reason. You're not going to use the hammer motif to then immediately start painting your next one in the opener too. But if you've finished using all of your strong hits, all party buffs have worn off, and you have a moment of calm before needing to run around, maybe get to painting. The best time to paint is any time a fight has downtime. What better time to paint than when you can't even attack? I'd also like to remind you about the in and out of combat timers. Before getting into combat, painting is instant and a short global cooldown. The first thing you should do when getting into any duty is to hit all three of your motif buttons. Or, well, less of them if you're level synced. Paint all of what you have before the tank pulls. If you get a bad tank in a trial or raid, they will pull instantly. Or maybe a bad impatient DPS or healer will pull before even the tank could. So the moment you gain control, don't dally. It may not be the end of the world if you don't get them all, but open it practice and all that helps you learn the pace of the job. Plus, Dawn Trail duties are actually kinda hard. Also, make sure to paint immediately after a fight in dungeons. You have plenty of time between encounters to get your paintings done. This way they are ready well ahead of the next group of enemies. If something goes wrong and you die, well that's okay. All progress made on your motifs is kept. If anything is painted, even progress toward Mog of the Ages and the later version of it, it will stay beyond death. Your palette gauge is going to empty out though. So in summary, strong skills, prioritize these where you can. Hammer is also great for movement. We have some utility skills as well. These are going to be extremely important for your survival. Level 10, Tempera Coat. On a long 2 minute cooldown, this will give you a shield worth 20% of your max HP for 10 seconds. Most raid wide damage is going to do more damage than that in higher level duties, even dungeons, especially in Dawn Trail. As a result, you'll be blocking a good amount of damage. At the very least, when doing solo content, you'll be using this often for keeping yourself alive. You'll also want to use this properly and often, because spending the entire shield is massively rewarded. Upon being spent, the cooldown of Tempera Coat is reduced by 60 seconds, functionally making it only a 60 second cooldown. Being able to block a decent amount of damage every minute? That's really good, especially in harder content. It's still no slouch in the easiest stuff that manages to spend it. Get used to timing this ahead of taking damage. Don't do it too early so that it falls off before the damage happens, but don't just skip it either. Level 20, Smudge. With a very short 20 second cooldown, Smudge will cause you to slide forward by 15 yams. This is based on the direction you are facing, even when targeting an enemy. This is a movement tool, obviously enough. If you are caught out of position, say far away from a boss when you shouldn't be, you can quickly dash toward the boss before you face consequences. You can also use it to dash during wall-to-wall -wall pulling. Some tanks can get ahead of themselves and start spamming their dash move to pull enemies. A bad idea it may be, they will do it. Smudge can help bridge the gap a little bit. Getting to the end of the pull sooner than later is always better. It can also be used in towns for a little bit of a push. You know, it's there. So that covers our full toolkit starting out. It's not a lot, and honestly, we don't get too much more. Those new buttons we do get will greatly change things up. Until then though, things are a bit basic. We also have a few traits I skipped over, but those are just potency boosts for lower levels. So let's talk about openers and how we start fights. Pre-pull, 
Paint all your motifs. Fire in red. Striking muse. Arrow in green. Palm muse. Wing motif. Starry muse. Hammer stamp. Winged muse. Hammer stamp. Mog of the Ages. Hammer stamp. Subtractive palette. Thunder in magenta. Blizzard in cyan. Stone in yellow. Water in blue. This opening kind of tries to resemble the one at level 100 for the purposes of teaching you the general flow of it. Remember, this isn't trying to be purely optimal. It doesn't feel entirely right. This is going to make far more sense at 100, but for now it does its job. Let's explain the how and why, as those are going to apply regardless. Obviously, before fighting, make sure we have all of our paintings made. Waiting until combat puts us very far behind. When it comes to a pre-pull attack, this is usually trying to time yourself with whatever the tank is doing. Outside of trials and raids, you're not likely to get any sort of countdown time to prepare an attack. But if you can start your cast as the tank is running in to pull the boss, all the better. Ideally, your attack lands at the exact moment the tank pulls. We're using Striking Muse first because we have 30 seconds to use all three attacks. Better to get it prepared ahead of time and the cooldown running. The next attack is there to give us a weaving slot. While this Palm Muse is likely to not be inside of any party buffs, let alone your own, it's fine because we then start painting the Wink motif into using Starry Muse. Now that we have everything buffed, we go all in for big damage. Start spending our hammer stamps for weaving space and using all of our OGCD abilities. Winged Muse and Mog for big damage right off the bat. Then end on Subtractive Palette for our big spell casts. Once those are gone, use basic attacks. Like I said, this only makes so much sense at level 80. It only comes together at the end because of what specific things we get. Now let's talk about an AoE opener. To which I immediately say that doesn't happen. It's more complex than that. Yet AoE spells are only better on 4 or more enemies, but most of our toolkit is AoE by default. Further, we will be dealing with much larger groups usually. Like, we could do something like this. Because of how the job works, you can do the exact same opener, but replacing single target spells with the AoE versions. The issue is, they had to buff tank AoE attacks because of a mix of bad tanks and bad Pictomancers. You should only be doing your opener once all the enemies are grouped up, when the tank is done pulling. In a wall-to-wall -wall pull, the tank will grab the first group of enemies, then run off to the next. If you start blowing all of your muses on the first pack, you'll both rip aggro and have nothing left once the whole pool is there. Tell me, what sounds better? 1000 potency and 400 potency on a group of 3? Or a group of 10? Further, your basic spells are really bad. Your AoE spells are only good on 4 or more, but even then they are really bad compared to your muses. At most, you're going to try and throw a basic spell or two on the way. Once the tank has stopped running, and you with them, unload everything. You can also pop Steel Muse while running. Make sure to get one shot off on an enemy, likely with Swift Cast, and pop Steel Muse. By the time the tank reaches the final group of enemies, you are going to have plenty of time left. It should never take 30 seconds for the tank to get from one group to the next, usually topping out at most at 20 seconds. So run with the tank, wait for the final pack of enemies with getting Hammer Muse ready, then go to town. The enemy should have their HP melt for as long as it takes you to get your Muses spent. Slow down for Subtractive Palette, and then basically you won't be much help with only a basic AoEs. So, a lot more complex than just a set in stone AoE. And unlike in Trials and Raids, stuff isn't going to come off of cooldown at the same time every pull. Kill time, speed of your tank, and much more are all going to change how much you have available for each pack of enemies. Try to use as many Muses as you can per pull, but how much is available pull to pull is going to differ every run. Also, try to aim your AoEs for the middle of the pack for hitting as many enemies as you can. Just hope the tank is grouping enemies up closely. Not all tanks will do a good job of that. This covers your Shadowbringers and starting toolkit. Your level ups are going to change things up immediately. Level 82, Enhanced Pictomancy. Remember when I said our levels would boost Starry Muse a lot? Well, we're already started. Now we will have 5 stacks of Hyperphantasia for 30 seconds. And while it isn't listed in the trait, you also get Inspiration. Inspiration reduces the cast 
and global cooldown of Star Prism and your Aether Hue skills by a whole 25%. What, Star Prism? I don't know why it's here, but you aren't going to get that until level 100. Anyway, this lasts for only 5 casts. Each spell you cast will cost you 1 Hyper Fantasia stack. So basically, 5 attacks get speed boosted by 25%. Consider that your subtractive palette skills are slower casts, and their supposed slower cast times get negated during Hyper Fantasia. Though this all comes with a bit of a sneaky twist. Before, Starry Muse didn't do anything but throw out buffs. Now it also places a large patch of grass centered on you, about the size of that initial animation. Inspiration and Hyper Fantasia only work in this circle. If you leave it, they don't work anymore. In most cases, this isn't a problem, but higher difficulty or higher movement fights can really push you to learn proper placement of this. Put it too far to the middle of the arena, and when you walk toward the outside for some mechanic, you end up walking out of your Starry Muse circle. Simply enough though, be in the circle you're placing with Starry Muse now. Spells cast are now much faster for 5 casts. Our openers are going to abuse this to the fullest at 100, and plenty enough in the meantime. Level 84, Enhanced Smudge. Now upon using Smudge, you will be given 5 seconds of Sprint, a movement speed buff. This is massive for making Smudge both a really good recovery tool, and just a generally good movement skill. If you're even slightly off with your Smudge angle, the speed boost allows you to move into position faster than without. You do, however, lose a bit of precision on that adjustment movement. Whatever reason you have for using Smudge, it likely just got better. When considering towns, you can Smudge, Sprint when the speed boost ends, then Smudge again. And obviously dungeons have benefits with wall-to-wall -wall pulling, but you'll likely be using Smudge when Sprint is already active. If you Smudge first and then Sprint, then you may actually end up going faster than many tanks, allowing for a few pot shots on the run. Level 84, Pictomancy Mastery 3. This is in its own section purely because it upgrades a lot of potencies and nothing else. Fire in red, arrow in green, water in blue, palm muse, winged muse, Mog of the Ages, Hammer Stamp, Blizzard in Cyan, Stone in Yellow, Thunder in Magenta, and Holy in White all get boosts. This just exists to balance lower levels poorly. Low level Picto is still pretty overpowered. Level 86, Enhanced Pictomancy 2, Hammer Brush, and Polishing Hammer. Enhanced Pictomancy 2 double dips. For one, it turns Steel Muse into a skill with charges. We can now hold up to two charges at once fully charging within two minutes. Secondly, Hammer Stamp now leads into a combo. Hammer Stamp will lead into Hammer Brush, which leads into Polishing Hammer. Just like a normal combo, these get stronger the further into the combo you get, and these are all direct crits. Hammer Stamp just got boosted to 520 potency, Hammer Brush is 580 potency, and Polishing Hammer is 640 potency. This was already insanely strong, but it just got way stronger. Having two charges means even more power. This second charge can be used outside of openness for movement, but make sure you do use it. Sitting on capped charges is just wasted power, but you may want to save one charge for movement in a specific part of a fight. 30 seconds from now, the boss is going to do stuff that forces you to be moving. Hammer combo is an instant solution, while being stronger than those holy and white casts you've been building up. So, unlike Holy and White, you Steel Muse every chance you get. Level 88, Enhanced Tempera and Tempera Grassa. This turns Tempera Coat into a mini sort of combo. After activating Tempera Coat, the button will turn into Tempera Grassa. Hitting this will remove Tempera Coat and instead grant a fresh buff for 10 seconds, extending the buff to all allies within 30 yams. Basically, any arena's full size outside of Alliance Raids. This is half as powerful as Tempera Coat at only 10% of your max HP, but will buff the entire party, which by extension scales to 10% of that individual player's HP, rather than granting everyone a shield of 10% of your max HP. It being spent also only reduces the cooldown of Tempera Coat by 30 seconds. It being party utility makes it far stronger than just being a personal shield, hence the lowered potential savings. This can be tricky to use because it's two different weaves. 
If you're in the middle of your hammer combo, you have a lot of weaving space to use Tempera Coat and then Tempera Grasa. If you are only in the middle of using your base combo, you have to do Spell Cast, Tempera Coat, Spell Cast, Tempera Grasa. Worst case scenario, you have Holy and White to give you movement and weaving space. The real tricky part though is the timing. Both buffs only last 10 seconds, but that technically means you have 20 seconds of leeway at most. On the flip side, you can't take damage in those 10 seconds of having Temperico up. A single hit that was avoidable or otherwise is likely going to take 20% of your max HP. If Temperico gets fully spent, you can't turn it into Tempera Grassa. You get one or the other. So technically this is a massive upgrade. It comes at a little bit of usability cost, but the relative simplicity of the job allows for this to be not too bad to fit in where needed. Level 90, Enhanced Palette and Comet in Black. Subtractive Palette has been granted a little bit of an upgrade. Every use of Subtractive Palette will grant monochrome tones. This will turn one glob of white paint into black paint. If you do not have any paint, your next obtained white paint will immediately be converted to black paint. This has both positive and negative effects. No matter how many drops of white paint you have, that black paint makes it impossible to spend your white paint. You must spend your black paint first. You also cannot stack multiple uses, even if you use Subtractive Palette back to back. If you don't spend your Comet before the next time you get white paint, you lose the Monochrome Tones buff, but you still get the white paint. You're also going to be very tempted to use your black paint, as this is used for Comet in Black. It's essentially the Subtractive Palette version of Holy in White. A slower GCD at 3.3 seconds, higher cost to 400 MP, and much higher power. How much power? 780 potency, with the AoE on all further enemies being 312 potency. Simply use this. Absolutely use your black paint. This is especially amazing in your opener, since we're buffing another very strong attack. Even outside though, Pictomancer continues to have devastating hits. For as much as these skills can be very useful, it doesn't affect the general rotation all too much now, does it? Some very important effects, utility, and power boosts but not new skills. This is especially obvious when you look at the opener at level 90. This opener will spend all five of your Hyper Fantasia stacks while keeping about the same pace as your level 100 opener and how it achieves the same goal. Beyond adding in the common and black, this is the same opener as we had at 80. There's no way we'd pass up that potency though. That's just too much to not make sure it's under party buffs. A short section for your opener, but that's not going to be true up to level 100. Dawn Trail's skills are your most important ones beyond the Mew skills. Level 92, Enhanced Pictomancy 3, and Rainbow Drip. Before we talk about the trait, let's focus on Rainbow Drip. This is a massive 4 second cast time with a 6 second global cooldown. It is however free to cast, and will grant us 1 drip of white paint. It does 1000 potency to the first target, and 150 potency to all enemies after the first. The AoE is a straight line in the direction of your selected target. However, when under the Rainbow Bright effect, Rainbow Drip becomes an instant cast spell with a GCD of 2.5 seconds, so a speed increase of 4 seconds and 3.5 seconds respectively. How do we get Rainbow Bright though? Well, Starry Muse got another upgrade. Rainbow Bright is given by spending all of your Hyper Fantasia. Essentially, this is your finishing move to Hyper Fantasia. After your fifth stack of Hyper Fantasia is spent, hit Rainbow Drip immediately. This also makes for a very strong opening move for boss fights, to the point that a tank not giving a 5 second countdown is just trolling at this point. 1000 potency as the first thing that hits the boss? That is huge. Plus the 2 seconds of time between cast and recast gives us a very nice weaving slot. Now, the AoE damage of this is kind of lackluster. It is still worth it though. That very high base damage makes it about even with your subtractive pallet spells, and often better in that it can hit more enemies. Most of your AoEs are 5 yams after all. A giant line AoE has the potential to hit way more enemies, especially when big enemies are around. Mid-combat, you are never going to want to manually cast to this. 
Only with Rainbow Bright will it be worth casting. Even if you swift cast, it's not going to be worth it unless that's the last hit of the fight. The boss dies when you use it in a swift cast. Slow casting, it's never worth it. Swift cast finisher and Hyper Fantasia only. Level 94, Pictomancy Mastery 4. This is just a power boost to, well, basically everything. The attacks that don't get a potency boost are Rainbow Drip, Living Muses, and Mog of the Ages. Every other skill got a boost. Your rotation and how to use your skills is unchanged, though. Level 96, Enhanced Pictomancy 4, Claw Muse, Fanged Muse, and Retribution of the Medine. Living Muse has gained a third charge. You can store up to three uses, though you won't ever let it get back to three charges ideally. The charge time is still 40 seconds, so the total time to get all three charges back is two minutes. We've also gotten two new Living Muses. These have the same potency as Palm and Winged Muse. They are Claw and Fanged Muse. These will come after your other two, giving you a new Living Muse order. Palm, Wing, Claw, Fang, and then repeat. This isn't just for show though. After Winged Muse, a Palm and a Wing makes a Moogle for Mog of the Ages. That is all the same. But what does a Palm, Wing, Claw, and Fang make? A Medine. Retribution of the Medine is an even stronger Mog of the Ages, sharing the same button. While Mog is sitting at a 1300 potency hit, Medine does 1400 potency. So every Winged Muse gives a Mog, and every Fang gives a Medine. A few notes on how these interact. If you already have a Mog of the Ages stored when you use Fanged Muse, Medine will completely overwrite the Mog. It is completely lost just like before. The reverse is also true. If you have Medine stored when you use Winged Muse, you will lose that Medine. This is important for when you get a Medine outside of openers. Because of gaining three Living Muse charges per two minutes, when your next Mog or Medine is gained is going to slowly shift. There will be a point where you will use a single Living Muse outside of openers, and then just hold on to that Medine until after you pop Starry Muse next. A small bit of optimization, but one you might figure out naturally anyway. Level 100, Enhanced Pictomancy 5, and Star Prism. Our final skill is yet another buff to Starry Muse. Starry Muse grants us Starstruck for the duration, giving us one use of Star Prism. Star Prism is ridiculous doing 1400 potency to your target, and 560 potency to all enemies within 5 yams of it. It also will heal all members of the party within 30 yams of the target for a heal worth 400 potency. This also spends a Hyper Fantasia, giving you even more reason to use it. The heal is very nice to have there, as often during openers there is big damage coming out. The issue is timing this to make it more than a bonus is going to be difficult, and a per fight basis. It's not impossible to do, and is recommended to learn because this also allows for movement, being an instant cast. If not for the heal, the extra movement is a good reason to be able to change the specific timing. For all we know, the Fruit Ultimate will make great use of that heal. Simply, any time you use Starry Muse, no matter what, you're hitting Star Prism. This is too good to pass up. Which means we're going to go into our level 100 opener now. Things have changed quite a bit from Dawn Trail skills, and the true overwhelming might that led to Pictomance and nerfs is truly shown here. I'm also going to make this one a karaoke opener. That's why I say the names of the skills as they are used. This gives you a better idea of the speed and tempo of an opener, rather than just a button order. Pre-pull. Paint all your motifs. Rainbow Drip. Striking Muse, Holy in White, Palm Muse, Wing Motif, Starry Muse, Hammer Stamp, Winged Muse, Hammer Brush, Mog of the Ages, Polishing Hammer, Subtractive Palette, Blizzard in Cyan, Stone in Yellow, Thunder in Magenta, Comet in Black, Star Prism, Rainbow Drip. Now that opener I started you with makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Let's go through the full opener to explain the how and why we do as we do. We start with preparing a rainbow drip because, I mean, 1000 potency for free the moment the tank is grabbing the boss. 
you actually want to start pre-pull casting Rainbow Drip at about 4.5 seconds on any countdown. This is because despite the cast time being 4 seconds, there is a short delay between the cast finishing and damage being applied. We immediately use the spare 2 seconds from the global cooldown of Drip to use Striking Muse. This preps it for actual use as the fight begins. We'll start with Holy in White because of the easy weaving it allows for us. Palm Muse comes out here. You might think this is a waste, but we gain more than we lose from painting the winged motif right after. Weave in Starry Muse to start buffing yourself and your party. We're going to use each of your hammer attacks for its weaving space, on top of them being high damage. Winged Muse and Mog of the Ages are immediately huge damage. Subtractive Palette comes in next so that we can start spending our Hyper Fantasia on our slow cast skills. The Aether Hue combo will grant us a dot of black paint for Comet in Black. We put Star Prism here for double the movement. This then allows for that free use of Rainbow Drip as our finishing move. The neat thing about Pictomancer is that this opener is completely freeform between Starry Muse and Rainbow Drip. As long as you're not somehow overcapping on your charges in the meantime, Rainbow Drip fits in at the very end of Starry Muse. The only specific order requirements are that Subtractive Palette has to be used to enable the stronger Aether Hue combo, and Comet in Black is only available after the combo giving you paint. And obviously Rainbow Drip after Hyper Fantasia. In Dawn Trail especially, mechanics seem to happen a lot during burst phases, so you may, for example, do Hammer Stamp into Subtractive Palette first, because you won't have the time in the back half of the opener to cast stuff. You may also need to use Swift Cast and can move the weaves around to fit that in too. As long as you use all these specific spells, Rainbow Drip should happen at the exact same time. A quick reminder for AoE, please do not waste your muses while running with the tank. You might rip aggro pointlessly, and hitting a lot of enemies is far better than hitting like, two. Dawn Trail enemies seem to have lots of HP, enough for this to be even more worth it than normal. Generally though, it's the same opener. You get a pot shot off so that you're counted as in combat during the wall-to-wall -wall run, pop striking muse during the run since runs are basically never that long, and then go full power when the tank stops. Just keep in mind that you will not have the charges for this specific opener every time. It's very common you will spend all available charges during an encounter, so the next one you'll start with less. Plus, consider starry muse is a 2 minute cooldown, this will absolutely never be up for every encounter. And if it is, you're probably doing the dungeon with only three players because damage should never be that low. Again, AoE is never as simple as following a standard opener. Hell, the dungeon might even start with a single pack of enemies. We've gotten one of those in Dawn Trail. Paint your enemies into happy little corpses and enjoy your time with such a unique job. Thank you for watching this Pictomancer 1 to 100 leveling skills guide. Feel free to give feedback or ask questions on what might still be confusing to you. I am always seeking to improve, as should you. Don't stop with this guide, even if I succeeded in helping you improve. Please leave a rating, comment, sub, those really do help creators. You can also come watch me on my Twitch or even go follow my Patreon. The links in the description will take you where you need to. Have fun in your adventures across Tyrol, and may the power of Anne and Nidhogg stay waste to your enemies.